guys, Simply Betta here. I am a betta fish enthusiast and fish keeper and I breed bettas. And today I'm going to be talking about what I feed my fish throughout the whole life cycle, all the way from the tiny itty bitty little fry to adults. I get a lot of questions about what to feed fish at, at what time, especially when raising spawns. So today I'm going to be talking about what I do. Do keep in mind that this is what I do. Other people might do things differently if you're really trying to research on what you're going to be doing for your spawns to raise your betta fish. Um, I'd suggest getting info from a lot of different places and come to your own conclusions on what you're going to do. Because everybody has their own opinions and has their own things that work for them, but this is what works for me. I'll be going through the foods that I use, starting from the tiniest, meant for the tiniest fry, all the way up to the biggest foods meant for adults. For my babies, for my fry, for my growing spawns, I keep my own live food cultures. It's important to note that um, betta fry really need live foods. They need live foods. They don't have the instinct to eat pellets or flakes. Their instinct tells them they need to be eating little live wiggly things. So in order to consistently give them what they need, I keep my own live food cultures. Most of these are pretty easy cultures. Um, they don't take a whole lot of effort and you'll have a consistent food source and that's important. The first food that I offer my spawns is called vinegar eels. Now they're not actually eels, they're these tiny little nematodes that you can keep in apple cider vinegar. It's super easy and it makes this really great first food for betta fry. They're tiny, they're so tiny you can hardly see them. So what I do is I have a little piece of coffee filter paper and I, I pour a few glugs of the apple cider vinegar in that holds my culture. I let it all drain out, fill it back up, and, and then I siphon it out with a syringe. One nice thing about vinegar eels is that they will stay swimming. They'll swim around, they'll stay up at the top levels of the water column. They don't just sink down. Like, like a lot of other live foods, I'd highly recommend using these as a first food. The next food that I like to use is called microworms. It's like the next size up in the uh, food category. These guys are super easy to culture. All you need is some oatmeal. Just have a little container with holes poked in the top. You put your oatmeal in, and then you put a microworm culture in, and maybe a little sprinkle of yeast. That's optional, really. And then pretty soon you're going to have this thriving culture of microworms. We'll start crawling up the sides of the container and then I just take like a q-tip or a little uh, pipette and I scoop up a nice little glob. I put it in some water and then I'll suck it up with a syringe and, and then I'll use the syringe to divvy out all the microworms to my various fry tanks. Very easy to culture. It's a great little tiny 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 food. One of the cons of microworms is that they sink. They'll slowly sink down to the bottom. But it doesn't really matter because betta fry are little hunters and they'll go down to the bottom and they'll pick up the microworms from the bottom of their fry tanks. After microworms, I'll introduce baby brine shrimp. Now, if you've ever read about breeding fish or raising fry, you've probably read about hatching baby brine shrimp. Baby brine shrimp are so nutritious. They're a great fry food, absolutely fantastic. They're a little more of a pain in the butt to actually culture. And what you have to do is you have to buy brine shrimp eggs. You have to set up like a little hatchery. They need salt water. Um, so you just make some salt water, you throw in a little few eggs, and you have to have a bubbler, and it bubbles all the, the eggs around. And after about a day or a day and a half, you'll start to see them hatch. And there'll be these tiny little red floating sweet swimming little tiny red specks. Those are the things that you feed fry and they're so nutritious and you'll get really good growth rates. I really like baby brine shrimp. There are cons to baby brine shrimp like the hassle of making them and also if you feed them too much, betta, little baby bettas can develop swim bladder conditions. So it's important to note not to feed too much baby brine shrimp but they're really really great and nutritious. After baby brine shrimp, I go to grindle worms. Grindle worms are really, really cool. They're just these tiny little white wormy things. They're really easy to culture. You just keep them inside, keep them at room temperature, put them in like some potting soil or peat or something, and just, I feed them dog food. I throw in a little kibble maybe every single day. Pretty soon I'm getting these huge masses of the tiny white worms. And I do the same thing as I do for most of my other live foods. I'll put them in a cup of water and then suck them up with a syringe and then use a syringe to divvy them up between all the fry tanks. And the fish go nuts. 
They go nuts over grindle worms. So you might have noted in the video so far, I'm not actually saying when to introduce the new for the new food. Some people are like, oh, for the first three days I do vinegar eels, and then for two more days I do microworms, and then I do blah 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 blah. But I don't really do that. I kind of just go by eye. For the first few days, I feed vinegar eels because baby bettas are like tiny, tiny little eyelashes, and they need tiny foods. Then I go microworms for a few days, and then I'll do baby brine shrimp once I feel like the fish are now big enough to eat baby brine shrimp. I don't start with BBS or baby brine shrimp because I feel like they're they're too big. They're too big for the tiny little little eyelash baby eyelash babies. So I like to wait just a few days to do that, and then I'll introduce grindle worms just when I feel like the fish are big enough to be eating the little grindle worms. I'm just going by eye, really. Okay, the fish start to grow a little bit, they get some size on them. I start to introduce gel foods. I really like rapashi, especially rapashi uh, spawn and grow. So rapashi is a gel food. What you do is you just, you take some powder, it's like one part powder and then a couple parts of water and you mix it and you throw it in the microwave for a minute until it starts to bubble. And then you let it cool down and you get this really nice gel food. As long as the fish are big enough and old enough to be interested in going after this this gel food, then that's when I start using it. So it's clean, it sticks together, the fish can peck off of it and eat it for quite a while. I really like to use the Rapashi products because of this. It's such a, it's a really great fry food. I got a selection of Rapashi from Aquarium Co-op. They sell all kinds of different fish foods that I usually buy from, like my Rapashi products. I like to use Rapashi Spawn and Grow. I like to use uh, the, the, what's it called, the meat pie or the carnivorous one for my adults. And then I also use the community blend for the adults. Highly recommend getting some rapashi because it's easy. It's just easy. It is a hit. Sometimes I even make my own gel foods. I've done it before. This right here is a meat based gel food. It's a beef heart recipe. The fish really like it. I had a lot of fun making it and it's lasted for quite a while. This is over a year old and I still have a few Ziploc bags. Now the cons between doing this versus buying a product like Rapashi is that it's a pain in the butt. You'd think it'd be cheaper, but after buying all the ingredients and the vitamins and the frozen food that I add in, it's not that cheap at all. And then in this particular batch, I didn't use enough gelatin. Um, so it's actually pretty messy and it comes apart and I usually only feed this right before I do a water change. But making your own gel foods is an option, but it's, you know, it's a little bit more of a pain in the butt. And in my case, it's messier and I don't like that. I need to fix my recipe or I'm just going to keep using Rapashi and just forget about making my own gel foods. Okay, I also use frozen foods for my bigger fry once they start becoming interested in it, plus for my adults. This is, this is a staple for my adults is frozen foods. I like to use frozen blood worms and I also do frozen brine shrimp cubes. For the brine shrimp cubes, I'll just take a whole cube and I'll throw it in a, a fry tank. That it falls apart really nicely and slowly and the fish love it. For the blood worms, what I usually do is I'll put a bunch of cubes into a little cup and I'll let them thaw. And then I use a pair of tweezers and I just take out, you know, a little tweezer full and I individually feed my adults this way. Uh, I'll also feed, feed my, my juveniles in their grow outs, blood worms. They're just, they're great. You can't go wrong with blood worms. I buy boxes, I buy cases of frozen blood worms and I store them in my freezer, <laughs> just in the kitchen. And for pellets, pellets are probably the easiest thing you'll ever feed your fish. Because of that, pellets are also a staple for my adults. If you have some pet betta fish and you want to be feeding them right, invest in a high quality pellet. And you don't even have to really invest. I mean, what is it, like a couple dollars? It's really not that much. I like to use Bug Bites. Bug Bites has a betta pellet now. So what's nice is that it comes in this container that's you just like shake it once or twice and you get a really good amount for one meal for one of your fish. And I like the Bug Bites brand. I like the fact that they're using black soldier fly larvae as their main protein source. I had a video about this a while ago explaining why I liked it, like as an environmental impact type thing. I like this pellet because it's easy. Another, some of, there's some really good pellets. Ah, oh, there are some other good brands. I really like Omega One. I like New Life Spectrum. Like, there are some good brands. I got my pellets from Aquarium Co-op too, except for the bug bites. Fluval sent me those to try, and I was pretty happy about those. But everything else I get from the Aquarium Co-op website. 
Another pretty easy option is to use dried foods, like dried live foods. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and I'm just gonna grab a pinch of dried blood worms and I'll throw them in some of my fry tanks. It's nice, they just kinda sit there up at the top and the fish peck at them. And I also use dried cubes of brine shrimp, which I also really like because they just sit at the top and they'll slowly fall down and feed the fish. Dried live foods are an option. That's pretty much it. That's you. That's kind of all that I feed my fish uh, throughout the whole life cycle. If you have any questions, just let me know in, down below and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Thanks for watching guys. I know a lot of you have been, been wanting this video and I've had a lot of questions on foods. And this way I can just kind of direct people towards this video instead of having to type out things every single time. It's really just because I'm lazy. <laughs> if you love Betta Fish, be sure to give it a like down below and maybe even subscribe to my channel. I'll have a lot of fun stuff coming up soon. I also have a Facebook that I check sometimes, an Instagram, and a Patreon now. So I'll put the links down below. Thanks for watching guys and have a great day.